Okay, I'd like to welcome to the program uh, Elizabeth Pancotti. She is a uh, policy advisor for Employ America. Elizabeth, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so let's you you obviously focus on 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 workers. Um, let's go through some of the the top line numbers, and then we'll 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 get into um, uh, some of the sort of I guess uh, more narrow questions of of the bill. We have two different types of unemployment essentially in this, right? We have we have sort of like a, a temporal extension and a uh, I guess a financial augmentation. Yeah, I think that's right. So there's an extension of some of the federal programs that give workers an additional 11 weeks of benefits on top of either their state benefits or their other federal benefits. And then just like we had from April through July, there's a top off to those benefits. So they'll get an extra $300 added to their checks for those 11 weeks. So give us a sense of like, all right, if if um, what, what happens if my unemployment runs out on the 26th, right? We have millions of Americans whose unemployment benefits run out. Are all those people extended? What, what, uh, give us a sense of, 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 of how that works. Yeah, so the, the like pipeline here is a little messy and a lot of it will depend on regulations. But what we know so far is that there are currently four types of programs you could be on. The first is that you're on state unemployment benefits, and that means you came on likely within the last 26 weeks, and you will stay on your state unemployment benefits until you exhaust, and then you will move on to a new program. So those people, they should be fine. They don't have to worry about anything. In a couple of weeks, they'll start to see $300 checks added on. Uh, we imagine that they won't be, so they should, they get started, they start to add on as of next week, but they probably won't see them on their checks next week. So they'll get a lump sum payment for that back pay. Okay. The second program they could be on is the PEUC program that was extended by this bill was set to expire Saturday. And that gives you 13 now 24 weeks after your state benefits. That program, uh, if people were on it, right, if they're on it right now, they will be extended on it. However, a lot of states, because of the timing of this bill, they had already set that to expire, and they would have moved workers on to another program called the Extended Benefits Program if they're like if their state is triggered on. So not all states have EB right now. And so for those people, it's possible they'll have a temporary lapse in payments or that they'll be temporarily moved on to another program just in this like interim period while we set up the policies of this new bill. The third program is the EB program and 24 states are currently triggered on to that program. And that gives workers between six and 20 weeks of additional benefits after their state benefits and PEUC. The problem, however, is in this bill, they, if workers were on state and then they exhausted PEUC, those 13 uh, initial weeks from CARES, and then they went on to the extended benefits program, they have to clear out all of their extended benefits weeks before they can go to these new 11 weeks. Now, the big problem with that is that if you get 20 weeks of extended benefits and you use those 20 weeks over the next 11 weeks, you're not actually going to be able to claim the new PEUC weeks. And so what would have been better is to allow workers to go back onto PEUC. It's kind of a use it or lose it situation for like your PTO at work, right? If you don't use it in the time that you have to use it, you don't get those weeks. And so it's the same situation. The last potential program you could be on is called PUA. And that's that program built for kind of uh, independent contractors, gig workers, or people who aren't eligible for UI traditionally. And so that program was extended also by 11 weeks. And those people... Uh, additionally might face this kind of lapse in payments where over the weekend, many programs were set up to kind of expire because that was what the bill text said and we passed a bill at the very last minute. And so it's likely that those people will lose benefits for a few weeks and then be brought back on and get back pay for those weeks. So that's kind of where we stand for the four different types. Uh, Elizabeth, <laughs> sorry. It's okay. I imagine you, uh, you study other uh, countries' unemployment uh, systems. How... I mean, I'm just sitting here, like, listen to you explain this, and um, and and thank you for being able to uh, walk us through this. But it sounds insane the way that we <laughs> set up. I mean, like, honestly, like, if I was going to sit into a laboratory and try and figure out what can I make the most complicated Byzantine system and make it like, and 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 really make people pay essentially for the benefits, the unemployment benefits that they're getting, like really make them, you know, just make it as painful as possible. This is what I would do. Yeah. I mean, I, it <laughs> sounds insane to me. Yeah. I mean, so I think the big problem is partially that there are 53 separate systems of unemployment insurance. because We've got all state systems, you know, DC, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. 
And so there are all of these different state systems that have different rules, different regulations, different enforcement of all these things, different benefit amounts, different eligibility. And on top of that, you have these new federal requirements and new federal programs that get implemented at the very last minute where we don't have time to implement them because we've defunded state UI offices. Like it's truly a terribly designed system and an intentionally terribly designed system. Like, you know, if we look at other welfare programs, it's incredibly hard in the United States to access these programs. Like none of these kind of barriers are accidental. And even in this bill, we see that. So now uh, a new thing was introduced in this pill for program integrity. And that is that PUA recipients of pandemic unemployment assistance, those like gig workers and people that aren't eligible for state UI, they will now be required to provide documentation for why they're eligible for PUA. And previously they could attest under the threat of perjury that they were eligible for X reasons. And then they would receive a bit of a benefit. And then if they provided income documentation, they could get a bit more, you know, they could contest for more money. And now they will be required to provide some sort of documentation for a COVID diagnosis, for their kids' school closures, for uh, needing to isolate because they have asthma or pre-existing condition, all of these different things. So far, we haven't seen, we'll need guidance from the Department of Labor to know exactly what they'll need to submit for those. But I mean, this language like came from you know, conservative offices that in the name of program integrity wanted to kind of create barriers for these workers. And as you said, like if we went into a laboratory and said, what are all the bad things we can do? We have done a lot of them. Uh, Emma's mic is not, or Sam, you're muted. Don't know how that happened. Go okay. ahead, Emma. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And additionally, I remember reading some things at the beginning of the pandemic um, about how state unemployment offices, some of them were still um, in the red or were uh, had, had very little money to provide for people. So that's why the federal assistance was so needed. But you have uh, state unemployment offices who are lacking funding, lacking money, and then also red state unemployment offices where they've basically been gutted entirely. So can you talk about the extra complications um, when it comes to some of those red states and some of those unemployment offices that are in, in dire straits financially and were so even before the pandemic began? Yeah. So, I mean, the the last few states that had loans for their, so basically what happens is employers pay taxes on their employees' wages into the UI system, and then they're distributed through the UI system. And so uh, in times of great unemployment, there are, the federal government issues loans to states so that they can pay out these benefits. And in the Great Recession, I think like 29 states had taken out loans uh, for to pay out these benefits. And, and up until a year ago, there were still a couple of states still paying off those loans, and many were not meeting federal requirements for solvency or the kind of minimum balances required in those funds. This is also coming, you know, between 2010 and 2019, many states scaled back the benefits that they provide. They scaled back the eligibility for these programs. I mean, they truly do make it very hard. Uh, they make it an inaccessible program and a kind of, you know, not as beneficial program as it could be. The average UI uh, benefit amount is about $375 and it replaces 30 to 40% of folks' income. And so, you know, this was, these are all intentional design pro programs. In the OECD countries, we have the lowest income replacement rate. And in fact, we uh, we replace 0% of income after six months because states only offer up to 26 weeks in most cases. And so, you know, I think in terms of financing right now, there are about $45 billion in outstanding trust fund loans that have been taken out since March by 22 states and, and DC. Uh, I, you know, there's no way these states are going to be able to pay back these loans and there are penalties for failing to pay back. They're not interest-free loans. And so, you know, we're, we're charging states even more money when I think you guys were just talking about to Jeff about how in the whole state budgets are. Um, these also, you know, these loans count against balanced budget laws in some states, uh, you know, and I think we'll see what happened in the aftermath of the Great Recession where states turn to austerity and they cut social services and they cut jobs because they don't have any money to spend. And it only benefit, you know, it, it only, it doesn't benefit anyone. Like it only harms workers and their families, especially with families who are struggling. I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the, the issue um, regarding the lack of funding for states and municipalities now is that you can say once the vaccine comes, we're going to have an explosion of economic activity and revenues are going to be back. But um, that's a real problem going forward because they're getting in the hole with these interest bearing loans. Yeah, I mean, they, these loans are not easy to pay back for many states in the Great Recession. They took five, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years to pay back. 
Uh, in this bill, there was no discussion of forgiving those loans or providing any kind of additional federal funding to CDI benefits. Um, this pop off is thankfully going to help a lot of workers, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't replace income after it ends. And it, you know, there's no, it's an 11 week extension, right? There was no kind of fight for this to be in place until the unemployment rate goes down or until there aren't 20 million people claiming unemployment. I think we're getting a little bit of static uh, from your uh, computer fan, I think. It's, oh, it, no. Yeah, is that it? You're sitting on a stack of books. Oh, I understand. Uh, <laughs> there, Oh, that seemed, I just hit mute and then unmuted and it seemed to have helped. Yeah, that helped a little bit. So, uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, all right, well, l- let me ask you about this because, I mean, it, it is, it's, it's stunning that we have such a, uh, a low replacement figure for employment uh, payments. Uh, but it's even more stunning when you contemplate the idea that we want to encourage people to stay at home during a pandemic. And... Uh, one of the things that was pulled out of the bill, bill was that employers will no longer have to provide paid sick leave to workers who get infected with COVID-19. Will you talk about this? Because this is just another thing that just sounds insane to me. I mean, first off, we should have mandatory paid sick leave just in general. <laughs> but during a highly contagious epidemic, I would imagine this is like the first thing that you would want. Yeah, no, I mean, it is the first thing we would want. There was a big fight that this was not, I mean, this was not included. Uh, we, we, any, in any summaries we saw of the previous kind of mansion Romney proposal, it wasn't included. Now it's included as a tax extender. And so businesses, if they offer paid leave, will be credited for that via taxes the same way that it was in CARES, except in CARES and in um, the second bill, Families First you uh, were, you had to offer this program. And now it's, you know, if you want to offer it, we'll pay for it. Um, I would imagine many businesses can't afford to go without workers when half of their workforce is out with COVID. And, you know, that's not a, a great thing. And so, you know, I think, yeah, you're right to say that in, uh, you know, in the 21st century, we should just have paid leave. There are five states that have it. And in the rest of them, you know, workers are left without any benefits in many cases. In addition, you know, uh, we don't have universal health care. And so folks are right now foregoing medical treatment, as, you know, including COVID treatment, because they can't afford to get it. And when you have 20 million people out of jobs and when your insurance is tied to your employment, it's very likely that, you know, I, I know when we get the figures for insurance rates this year, it's going to be really bad. And I don't know how you would afford, you know, if you're not eligible for Medicaid, I don't know how you would afford like an Obamacare program uh, or, a, you know, a, a private insurance exchange um, program where you could be in, covered by insurance after you lost your job on unemployment, that's, you know, $300 a week. So I think it's, it's like a two part issue. Like this is one, a public health crisis and two, an economic crisis. And they're very intertwined and somehow every policy we have and every policy response we have just comes up short in failing to, um, you know, provide for both of those issues. And we should say, even in the best case scenario, uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm saying that half facetiously, you lose your job, you're not eligible. It's not like you can go immediately on Medicaid, right? Like Because the numbers that they're looking at are backward looking numbers, not forward looking numbers. So if I'm out of work and I'm out of unemployment, and I'm looking forward and I have no income coming in, I'm still not eligible for Medicaid until that period of time is in my rear view mirror. And so we're going to have these huge gaps where people are not getting covered. Um, so what else, is there anything else in the bill or anything else that is absent from the bill that you think is absolutely crucial uh, to know about? And maybe one that in the event, I mean, there's talk that Biden is going to go for a second bite at this apple later. I don't know under, under you know, uh, you know what will have to happen to Mitch McConnell for that to happen. But uh, let's just assume maybe there's a chance that uh, the Democrats win in Georgia. What, what is sticks out as you look at this uh, advocating for workers? Uh, what, what sticks out? for you in this bill? Okay, so I'll say three things that I think we have to fix and then one thing that's really good. I'll start with the good news. So the SNAP and the nutrition assistance uh, benefits in this bill, actually there's two. So SNAP and nutrition benefits in this bill are amazing. Uh, there's a huge increase, especially for households with children. Um, and given that you know school closures are happening again, we're heading into the holidays where kids aren't going to school, that's gonna be a really big help to households with children when we know, you know one in five households with kids can't put enough food on the table. And so that I think, you know, the SNAP provisions of this bill really will help workers and their families, especially, you know, those on, on unemployment insurance. Let the me second, one caveat to that. Yes. Because my understanding is that there's a ton of money sitting at the USDA that has not been delivered to folks 
to those kids in particular who have not been getting their lunches in schools, that they have not gotten the funds. Uh, so the funds have been allocated, but uh, because of the nature of the administration we have now, that really does not have very much interest in government functioning. The money's not reaching the people it's supposed to. That's true. We do have a new U.S. Department of Agriculture secretary on his way. And so I would hope that that's, you know, a day one priority. You know, I think there are going to be legislative priorities for the Biden administration and administration uh, administrative priorities that should be, you know, on the top of the list for administrative. The second good thing in the bill is that it includes $25 billion for rental assistance. We know that one in six renters are behind in rent by thousands of dollars. And so, you know, working with local housing agencies, states and, and the federal government are really going to inject money into into that. And, you know, I can't imagine, you know, the eviction moratorium is only extended to January 31st. I don't know how you would back pay $5,000 in rent by the end of January when you're making $200 a week in UI. And so that I think is another bright spot of the bill. I guess the, the one is too, is that we didn't include liability shields for corporations. And that's a huge thing. You know, McConnell had been very insistent. Republicans had been very ins insistent about stripping even the like small fines that OSHA is able to give out for the past several months and to pass a huge stimulus package, even if, uh, not as big as we need or not as big as we would have liked that that not being in the bill, I think is is monumental. The three things I think we need to fix are, uh, you know, there are a couple of technical provisions in the UI part that I think had, you know, had we not been negotiating with, you know, McConnell and people like Chuck Grassley and whatnot, like those wouldn't have made it into the bill. And so if there was room to make those technical uh, you know, those technical adjustments, I think that'd be a big thing. Um, you know, Senator Wyden had a really, really great UI bill come out, I think two or three weeks ago that would have included all of those technical fixes and would have really expanded access and integrity in the program. And I think for workers. And so I think, you know, focus, if we could just take the Wyden text and make it into a bill, that'd be great. Senator Warner also fought really hard for those provisions and they didn't make it into the bill. And so I think more work there is needed. The second thing is that we extended these programs for 11 weeks. We extended an eviction moratorium for one month. Like none of these timelines are sufficient, nor do they really even get us through like the installment of the new administration, given that we're going to spend all of January and February on hearings. And so I think, yeah, I think Employee America has been shouting about this and all the nerds have been shouting about this. But if we stop tying arbitrary end dates to these policies and said they will be in place until the unemployment rate falls or until workers no longer need them or until renters no longer need them or until state and local governments no longer need them, that I think is a big thing that, you know, we should just say until the unemployment rate is back where it was before February, provide enhanced unemployment insurance. The last thing is the language around the Federal Reserve lending facilities that I think you and Jeff touched on before I was on. And, you know, Senator Toomey fought really hard to end these lending facilities. He did say in a statement, and so did Secretary Mnuchin, say, they said that, you know, Janet Yellen and, and Chairman Powell could come back to Congress and say, we need these facilities and we need backstops for them. And, you know, you need to provide funding and authority for us to lend to state and local governments and, you know, to corporations that employ people. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the, those programs, those lending facilities were designed in such a way that many, you know, municipalities and state and local governments and, you know, all sorts of people couldn't use them effectively. And as a result, we're either going into, you know, either cutting spending or going into a kind of private market debt where a Federal Reserve lending facility could have helped them. Um, and we could have kept workers on payroll. We could have kept state and local governments in check. And so those, you know, were designed with Secretary Mnuchin to really exclude the kind of power that they could have had. Uh, unfortunately, the language in this bill really does limit the 13-3 lending facility um, powers of the Fed, especially for emergency facilities. And so I think revisiting that and trying to, you know, inject uh, what we can into creating effective lending facilities at the Federal Reserve would probably be a good place to start, too. All right. Good. Just quickly, I just want to go over those last two. Um, the automatic stabilizers you were talking about, which is basically saying instead of uh, an arbitrary cutoff, eight weeks, 11 weeks or whatever, we benchmark it against the success of the economy, essentially, yeah. it, as measured by how many people are working, how many people are, you know, need food assistance, whatever it is in terms of we benchmark it based upon the needs of the American public. This is something that was uh, people were highly critical of the Democrats for not pushing more in the original CARES Act because that was the last time that there was a lot of uh, leverage. And, this, and the second point, uh, and, and you need a legislative fix for that, we should say. Right? like that That's not something that the administration can extend uh, unilaterally through existing statutory authority. Uh, although I would imagine there's some play in some of that, uh, but I, I don't I don't know. But, I think when end dates are codified into legislation, you don't have a lot of room in regs to change them. Okay, fair enough. And then in terms of the lending facilities, do you need a legislative fix for that? Or is there authority that the Fed has 
so they could unilaterally extend some of these lending facilities for states and cities? Uh, so I think that will come down to the interpretation of the phrase, the same. So it was, you know, in the text, there was a lot of arguments of whether or not the lending could, could we stand up facilities that were similar to the ones stood up in by the CARES Act or, or prior to by the Federal Reserve and kind of backstopped by that 450 or so billion dollars? Or do we need legislation for the Fed to lend to these types of programs? Honestly, there, I think it's going to be a lot of lawyers duking out what needs to be done administratively and what needs to be done uh, through, you know, uh, legislation there. I think it's, it's really just going to be a fight among a bunch of lawyers. Um, I will say that 13.3 does provide for even more, you know, the Federal Reserve Act section for this, um, does provide even more, I, I would argue, and my colleagues at Employer America would argue that, you know, they had a lot more wiggle room than they had taken advantage of. And Chair Powell could have been more aggressive on these facilities, even in absence of legislation. Um, I think, you know, there may be caution to do that, given how politicized this was. And I think, you know, Fed independence is so important that people are, are really hesitant to kind of step on the toes of that or to kind of sound any alarms on that. And I would hope that, you know, there we would push the bounds as far as we can so that the Fed can step in to save the economy. There, I think, though, you know, senators didn't like when the Fed started doing things uh, when they weren't doing anything. And so I, I think it, you know, people ignore the Fed a lot of times and that is maybe the wrong decision. I think Chair Powell did a lot of good to say this is how far we can push things when Congress isn't acting. And I would I, I would assume and hope that he will continue to do that in coordination um, with Secretary Yellen when she comes into office. Elizabeth Pancotti, Policy Advisor, Employee America, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. 